Elden Ring is absolutely brimming with hidden secrets and obscure lore. But out of the hundreds of different bosses, enemies, and NPCs you can encounter, there's only one enemy type that the game itself calls mysterious. The Crystallians. In trying to learn more about the Crystallians, I found some surprisingly deep connections between the lore of Elden Ring and Judaism. Beyond the obvious, of course. My reformed Orthodox Rabbi Bill Clinton, thank you everybody. Let's turn our attention to the Shattering Crystal spell. The Crystallians are inorganic beings, yet they live. They cleave close to the ideals of the primeval current, and as such, they are revered guests of the sorcerers. The Shattering Crystal spell confirms that the Crystallians are alive and not some type of automaton. While crystal darts can frenzy the guardian golems, imps, and watchcats, they don't have that same effect on the Crystallians. Nevertheless, there is still a connection between the Crystallians and these manufactured guardians. According to the item description for the crystal dart, long ago it is said that a golem crafter employed a similar crystal tool. In addition, the item description for the Crystallian spirit ashes say that the Crystallian was itself hewn from crystal long ago. This seems to suggest that whoever carved the Crystallians may have also built the other golems. Of course, there is another major link between the Crystallians and the golem. The design of the Crystallian bears a striking resemblance to their golem, an influential trilogy of German expressionist cinema. Their golem tells the famous legend of Rabbi Judah Löw. In the film, the rabbi is a learned astronomer who foresees disaster for the Jewish population of Prague. Soon enough, the Holy Roman Emperor orders the expulsion of all Jews. To defend his community, the rabbi forms a golem out of clay and brings life to his creation. The film also depicts the golem as strong against pierce damage, and there's a fun souls door opening too. Although Rabbi Löw was a real person in 16th century Prague, the idea that he created a golem is significantly more recent and actually dates back to the 19th century. At the same time, the golem legend was already centuries old by the time of Rabbi Löw. By alluding to the Golem film trilogy through the visual design for the Crystallians, Elden Ring also connects them to the deep lore of the Golem in Jewish folklore. Creating artificial people has long been sanctioned by the Talmud, one of the foundational texts for Judaism. One passage of the Babylonian Talmud mentions how rabbis created a Golem as well as a calf. In fact, they could potentially even craft an entire world. One of the most common themes behind the Golem is the notion that the Golem can be a vessel for the soul. For instance, there's a midrash, which compares the divine creation of Adam, the first man, out of dust, to men creating a golem. This is made even more explicit in the Babylonian Talmud. In the first hour of the day, his dust was gathered. In the second, an undefined figure was fashioned. In the third, his limbs were extended. In the fourth, a soul was cast into him. The word golem is actually mentioned in the Bible, but only once, in Psalm 139.16 and it's a rather surprising usage. There, it's represented as unformed, or galmi. More broadly, anything unfinished can also be described as a golem. To sound more consistent with Elden Ring, I'll be quoting the New King James Version. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. The use of the word galmi in this psalm about a woman's womb is critical. As something unfinished, a fetus could also be considered a golem. With that in mind, let's return to Elden Ring and view one of the most important items for this analysis, Selen's Primal Glenstone. According to its description, a primal glenstone is a sorcerer's soul. If transplanted into a compatible new body after their original body dies, the sorcerer will rise again. Now if you look closely, you can actually see a small fetus embedded within the glintstone itself. The connections are made even more explicit during Selen's questline. When the tarnished extracts it from her, it almost sounds like she's giving birth. Thank you, my apprentice. This is my essence. What you hold is my very being.
So like how the golem is a vessel for the soul, I argue that the Crystallians were created as a vessel for the primal glintstones of sorcerers. If true, that would effectively grant immortality, albeit with extra steps. Indeed, when doing a questline, Selen even implies that she swapped bodies more than once. Moreover, the Cuckoo Surcoat makes clear that there is a connection between the primeval current and the ephemeral nature of the body. Similar to how cuckoos lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, the ancient astrologers and their descendants may have used primal glintstones to transfer their consciousness and overcome the transient nature of the body. For more insight into the primal glintstone, let's turn to the primal glintstone blade. The old sorcerers would slice open their hearts with these blades to imbue a primal glintstone with their soul, and thus did they die. The original 1.0 item description is slightly different, and instead said to remake their souls in glintstone. Meanwhile, the German item description for the primal glintstone blade suggests that this imbuing process had a very low success rate. That roughly translates as futile? Perhaps. Fatal? Absolutely. It's notable that you can get this talisman only after reuniting the spirit jellyfish Aurelia with her sister. And the location is also key. It's at the Stargazer's ruins in the mountaintops of the giants. Of course, this is a FromSoft game, one of the few generally wholesome moments also unlocks one of the game's most unsettling pieces of lore. Since we transplant Selen's primal glintstone into a new puppet body for her, I also argue that the Crystallians are a precursor to the puppets, widely believed to have been pioneered by the Nox. Puppets would further refine the art of housing a transplanted soul. Although puppets lack the defensive exoskeleton of the Crystallians, they can be crafted to better suit a person's abilities. For instance, when doing a quest line, Selen remarks that her new body is truly a gem, young and full of vigor, a snug fit for my primal glintstone. Unlike the Crystallians, which come in just three varieties, caster, spear thruster, and ring blade thrower, puppets offer a lot more variety. In the game, we can encounter the puppet forms for a Nox Night Maiden, a Dung Eater, a Pothead, a Finger Maiden, to name just a few and the Selian and Rayo Lucario crystal tunnels are strikingly close to the eternal cities of Nokron and Oxtella. To me, this all suggests a link between the puppets and the Crystallians. In addition, we do know that the Crystallians were manufactured, but not by human hands. The descriptions for the crystal sword and spear all state that these weapons were fashioned from pure crystal, a deed impossible for a human. The inscrutable Crystallians have but one clear purpose, to safeguard their crystals unto the end. One theory posits that they yearn for the return of their creator, who will call for them new brethren. Although the mention of a creator returning is presented in the game as a theory, if true, this would imply that carving new crystallians has become a lost art. This is speculation on my part, but based on the close links between the Cardians, the Trolls, the ancient astrologers, and the crystallians, I think the crystallians were crafted by the Trolls. Since the crystal weapons all tell us they were crafted not by human hands, it's most likely they were carved by a neighbor of those ancient astrologers. We learn from the Sword of Night and Flame that the astrologers, who preceded the sorcerers, established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky, and considered the fire giants their neighbors. The sword is also found in the Cardia Manor, which further links the Cardian royal family to those ancient astrologers. Meanwhile, the hammer item description tells us that smithing originated from the giants, while the trolls themselves are a form of giant. And while the fire giant incantations are all based on faith, the troll knights can cast sorceries with their intelligence. One fascinating line of lore comes from the magic downpour spell, dropped in the Cardian study hall. This spell is said to have been taught by the Crystallians, to mark the swearing of the old Concord. We can find Crystallians at the Moonlight Altar, which is only accessible through Vani's questline. Otherwise, the lift is blocked by a seal. Whenever you cast a spell, a sigil for that school of magic briefly appears. The sigils for the Cardians and the Crystallians look identical. The Crystallians' presence at the Moonlight Altar further links the Crystallians to Cardia, Giovanni, and Celia by way of the Nox. It's also intriguing that in the original Japanese text, this kanji is used to denote the concord both with the Crystallians and the oath sworn by the trolls. Finally, we do see Eiji wearing a custom-made mirror helm which shows that at least one troll today still knows how to work with crystal. To my eyes, the troll's hammer looks a lot like the watchdog's staff, and after all, the crystal darts were made by a golem crafter. This further supports the notion that the trolls created the crystallians and those other golems. Thank you so much for watching. This is a companion piece to another video I did that involves the crystallians. 
That video explores the philosophy of yoga and how it relates to the primeval current.